So I decided to immigrate to UK. I had a backpack and maybe two grand in my pocket. No family, no friends here. I would skip days without meals. Oh, it was terrifying. I got rejected by interviews and then I was fired two times in a row. And that's where I started Sigma OS. Ignition sequence starts. Every single startup that has ever made it out of the 1200 existing unicorns in the world, all of them followed this process, this one process. How much did you raise? We raised about $4 million. Less than 24 hours, a thousand people just like signed up. Hundreds of thousands of people have used and downloaded and are enjoying it. Our goal is to change the internet forever. Hello, my dad. How are you? Shatori. I'm good. Khuban, <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm very well. My best mate is Iranian, so he was giving me some um, pointers on on some Iranian stuff to use. So people who don't know you, well, I'm sure most people will know you who are listening to this. Um, you are the founder, well, co-founder, right, and CEO of Sigma yeah. OS, which is like this yeah. new productivity browser for startup founders, students, and people who need, need to like optimize their workflow. Elevator pitch. So I would... Describe us less about productivity. Productivity is a byproduct of what we do. Okay. We are a new macOS browser that is designed to make it easy for everyone to be fast and organized and be better at what they do online. We do that by making it super easy for you to create flows thanks to workspaces, uh, which that means like you can create contexts that make sense to you whether it's your company hub, analytics, writing, socials, all that kind of stuff live in things we call workspaces. Imagine Slack workspaces, but for your browser, all your tabs, documents live in one place. And then we make it also easy for you to uh, multitask with something we call a split screen. So you can have two uh, pages open at the same time next to one another. You can easily drag and drop or use keyboard shortcuts. And the third thing that makes it easy for you to be fast and uh, on top of everything you do is our um, search, which we call lazy search because we believe lazy people should be able to do very productive things as well. And uh, it's essentially a search engine for your browser. You can search any tab, anything you need. You just hit space on your keyboard. It opens up. Not only can you search the internet, but you can search your browser. Anything you need within the browser, you can easily type and find it. And yeah, that is a very quick explanation of what Sigma OS is. Awesome. I mean, I'd encourage people to try it. I've used it and I think it's sick. Um, nice. I've got, there's a lot of browsers out there at the moment. So I've got yes. a couple on the go, but I'm liking Sigma a lot. Um, you guys have had a lot of success, I'd say. Um, obviously, building a startup is a long journey. But getting funding is the first of many steps, but it's a big step that a lot of people yep. don't make it through. So you've been through YC. Yes. Let's start with your personal journey to starting Sigma. And then I'd like to know about how you raise money. And I want to hear a funny story about rejection. There must be one. <laughs> oh, there's so much rejection. Like I, it's always funny when people say, oh, you've had so much success or anything like that, which I don't believe that, but if you compare the stack of rejection to the stack of like little wins here and there, it's just like the stack of rejection is so much more. And that's the beauty of like this whole space that we're in startups is more no's than yes, but that yes makes it so much more enjoyable. Thanks to all the no's essentially. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's talk about that actually. Let's talk about that. What was, what were some big rejections then? And how do you frame rejection? Uh, rejections for me was like being. <laughs> I, I hope you're listening, Seba. Um, I was fired after a week at Deeds, uh, a very hot startup these days, uh, great founders. And I joined them as one of their uh, first hires. And after a week, they were like, it's not working. Like the thing I was good at and the things they needed didn't work out. And they were like, we need to let you go. And after that, another place I went to, I got fired as well. And then uh, I joined this company called Loop, uh, which that's where I met my two co-founders, my current co-founders. They were co-founding this company and I was their first engineering hire. And that was 
basically the first like yes after so many no's. Before that, I was even rejected for interviews or anything like that. So I got rejected even by interviews. And then I was fired two times in a row. And then I found this place, uh, Loop, which basically I was there and ended up becoming their lead engineer for iOS and built a lot of great stuff. Um, so again, a lot of rejections along the way uh, when I was uh, after doing a bunch of like work at startups and I decided to start my own thing finally, um, EF rejected me. So entrepreneurs first kind of focus on bringing founders together to build great stuff. They rejected me because they thought I'm not technical enough. Antler tried to reject me because they thought I'm not uh, commercial enough where I was like, I'm actually more technical. Um, and that's where I started Sigma OS. And then I got a lot of rejections for investments, but then also a lot of yeses for investment. And that's how we ended up, um, you know, getting investment, our first check, and then going on to YC, which funny enough, my co-founder Ali got rejected from YC seven times before this uh, eighth time getting into YC. And I was rejected by YC like three times before that as well. No so. Way. Did, oh, did you learn stuff from those rejections that now enabled you to get into YC with Sigma? Yeah, of, of course. Like, yeah. it's practice, right? The more you write, do things, you learn and become, get more clarity on everything that you're doing. Uh, for example, doing the application more and more meant uh, we understood the questions better and we understood our business better or the thing we were going to try. But also the most important thing rejection does then just learning, it gives you a thicker skin. And for building a startup, you need a very, very thick skin because it's not an easy job whatsoever. Whoever thinks like, oh, I'll start my own company and, you know, a year in, I'm going to be drinking champagne in a penthouse and like everyone's going to love what I'm doing. That's not going to be the case. There is going to be a lot of bad and harsh moments at the beginning, a lot of feedbacks that might feel a bit unwarranted or really uh, harsh. And you need to have a thick skin to be able to be like, this is a person that is just being, um, you know, cruel for no reason. And this is actually a good feedback that I need to take and improve on and become better. And that's the same thing with jobs, like um, getting fired by B and all the other places that I was at meant like, okay, I need to upskill myself and be better than what I thought. And that's, that's, you can take it two ways, right? One way is like, I'm going to get better. The other way is like, uh, you crumble and you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do anything and change industries. I had friends who have changed completely industries because they were getting rejected by jobs. So. Yes. Yeah, I can tell that you've got a very, positive relationship with like failure and rejection you've had <laughs> two two startups that didn't work right that you tried at uni yeah so i tried uh this thing the first year of uni uh which was meant to be like food sharing right students make their own food and they put it on the platform uh the leftover or a bit of portion and you can go pick it up from your hallmate essentially and Nobody liked that. Nobody cared for that. I had a problem with that, but most people didn't care enough for that. And that was something I learned, like, look at the, don't get excited about your own problem or your own solution and just be like, everyone will love that. Of course, everyone would love that. And that was more reinforced when I tried my second startup, which was, we, I called it a real fit, which the idea was like, use your phone camera to measure yourself in a mirror and then try on clothes in augmented reality. And that also didn't go anywhere. The technology was super cool and exciting. And I always wanted to work in uh, augmented reality and holograms and that kind of vibe. But reality was, it wasn't a big enough problem for people because at that time ASOS was around now and people would order clothes they didn't care enough. There wasn't a big enough problem. They would order extra clothes, try them on, and return the ones that they didn't like. So it wasn't a big enough problem for them to be like, okay, I need I need this new solution. Sounds cool, but 
not a big yeah. enough problem. Yeah, I actually tried on for the first time our headset last weekend, and I was like, "This <laughs> is actually it? wild." Um, I can definitely see myself with a VR headset. So, what keeps you going? Like, why do you keep going? What is your goal? Where are you, where are you headed? In terms of uh, for Sigma OS specifically, uh, what keeps us going is every day we receive hundreds and hundreds of feedback, love and hate at the same time, right? Uh, people who are saying like, thank you for building this. And people that say like, why did you change uh, this thing about browsers, right? I hate it. Like, give me the option to go back to everything that looked like Chrome. And that is the interesting part. That is the enjoyable part for us, where it's just like we are getting caught up a product that hundreds of thousands of people have used and downloaded and are enjoying it. And that for us is a very, that for me specifically is an interesting concept of building a product that touches people's lives on a daily basis, every day, every day uh, when they wake up and they want to go to this incredible, insane thing that we call internet. And they have chosen us to be the home for that. That's why we call, we are not saying we are only building the browser. What we're saying is like we're building the new home for your internet, your internet, right? Everyone's internet is a bit unique to them. And we are building a house, a home for that, where you have everything you need and love in one place, very much neat and tight and, you know, just like your home where your kitchen is nicely, everything you need for your cooking and kitchenery stuff is there, your bedroom, your everything, right? And that's what keeps us going, all of us, even when it gets very, very rough at times. I think it's something that's underappreciated by a lot of people because most people just think that you have Chrome or Safari, and I don't think they'd even consider changing the browser in terms of like making a new one. So how did you come up with the idea? How did you, where, where was the inspiration? Where did it come from? So for me, uh, it was a bit of a backstory. Like, so I come from Iran. I was born and raised there. And I never realized I had few issues. Uh, in 2019, I was diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD. Back home in Iran, when you have those things, they just call you um, undisciplined and you don't have attention to uh, details. So... I was never able to build those habits of, okay, how do I stay on top of everything and not get distracted and feel overwhelmed all the time? And I started then investing a bit in myself, try different tools, products, and make it easier to stay in the zone, be focused fast at what I do, and uh, be better, essentially. Try to be better. Um, and when I was at Antler and thinking about different product ideas, uh, whether it was in AI, funny enough, generative AI was one of the things I was uh, considering at that time. Uh, I realized this tool that I'm using to do all my research, all my work, like is a browser and it's broken. I had like two Safari windows open for personal stuff and like four or five different Chrome windows open. And I had like 20 tabs across each window. And I had I was the person that always did everything neatly, but I would still, after a while, had to do this thing we call uh, tap app bankruptcy, where I had to close everything because I didn't know what is where and what is what. So I thought to myself, why am I, how about I do the crazy thing of building my own browser? Started tinkering with it. And the first thing I did actually, and this domain, we still have it. Uh, the, I bought the domain, I hate my browser.com. And I was like, let's find out how many people hate their browser, actually, because that's a genuine question. Most people probably just want Chrome, and Chrome is good enough. And I tweeted it out and did a bit of poll and everything, uh, run a little bit of ad to see how many people will sign up. And within, like, I think it was 24 hours, less than 24 hours, a thousand people just, like, signed up to IHateMyBrowser.com. And I was like, okay. Signed up Then for there's what? a wait list. Just a wait list of, okay, hey, we're building a new browser, and, it oh, okay. might look like this. 
right? Okay, so there's no product, there was no, nothing, nothing, no team. It was just an idea. It was just like, me, yeah, me, Figma, and Namecheap, and Twitter. Like th these were the initial thing, the four things I used to test to see is this could this be a thing. And then I started building it, a bit of prototype, and showing it to a few people, onboarding to users, testing it. And I s slowly realized, like very, sorry, I very quickly realized, um, actually a lot of people feel the same way, right? But we've been conditioned to think, this is the best you get, so live with this, be happy with this, and be content with this. But reality is, actually, there is something that is much, much, much better out there. And I'm so glad that there are so many more browsers coming out and trying to improve this most important part of our life, which is the internet and access to the internet, right? That's where we're living. That's where we're working. And the browsers that we are using today, mostly a lot of people were designed 15 years ago for a whole different use case. We now work on the web, we live on the web, we entertain ourselves on the web. We do so much more than just opening a Google search or 20 Google searches. We are not working on local apps, we're more working on web apps. And having basically a browser that enables you to do what you need to do, whether it's having 100 tabs open, a lot of people think when we say stay on top of yourself means like you don't need, you should have five tabs per workspace. Have as many as you need. When you need it, you need it, right? It's just more important that uh, it makes it easy for you to have them there. Like you can't uh, judge someone if they have 100, 200 books because they need those books. Those books are information for them that they really need. But if you don't have a bookcase for those books, it's going to lie everywhere and it's going to be a mess. So we created a bookcase for everything you have. I think, yeah, it's an amazing idea. Amazing idea. And I definitely struggle with that. Um, keeping focus on tasks, especially in this day and age, like we all have unlimited distractions. Um, so I think you guys don't serve ads, right? No. So the model is so, a bit different. So it's a subscription model. Yeah. So but it's free for individuals. Yeah. So, because I think that's an amazing feature that you should talk about more because the fact, I, I honestly read an article and there's four ads and every time I look in my brain's in a different place and that like mental switching has just ruined what I'm trying so to get out of the article. We have a built-in ad blocker, even on our free version, uh, to do exactly that, to remove these kind of nonsense distraction. And the reason we decided to be a paid browser was we never wanted to depend on, you know, the well-being of the company on search engine deals or anything like that. We wanted that users are in control of their data and we run the business using basically the subscription that we get from users. Uh, technically, no browser is free. Chrome, Safari, Firefox, all of them make money. Safari, the reason you're using it for free is the fact that Google pays it $15 billion for search engine deals. The reason Google can you know, have Chrome for free is because Google search engine earns a lot of money by being the default search engine on it, right? And so on and so forth, that goes for Safari. Safari last year made a billion, uh, sorry, Firefox last year made a billion dollars, right? And that is off of your data, that's it. It's not magic, money doesn't grow on trees. It comes from somewhere and it's from the fact that they are able to use your data, the searches you make, serve that to, um, you know, advertisers and um, you know have these speed dials of, hey, here are some suggested pages for you. Those suggested pages are paid for. So that's how they're earning money on you. And we said, we don't want to complicate that. We're not about all these complicated uh, you know, financial structure that might make the quality of the product drop. We care about building a very good, easy, and incredible experience for every user. And in terms of how we make money, make sure we keep running. We charge you about uh, $10 a month. Uh, and as a student, $5 a month. And that's it. Very easy. No 
complication or confusion anywhere there. That's awesome. And yeah, I'm, I'm definitely bought in anything to get rid of the ads. So how do you manage your ADHD? And also, I think what you said about discipline, how people assumed you weren't disciplined. Yeah. Um, I struggle with discipline in the traditional sense because I'm similar. I flip between different things all the time. How do you manage that? And how do you think about the positives of having that sort of um, personality? So there is a lot of misnomer about ADHD, interesting enough. ADHD is, doesn't mean necessarily like, oh, you're a person that is unable to focus. Actually, the interesting part with ADHD is this um, thing called ADHD lock. For example, you can lock on something and it can be a negative or a positive thing. For example, if you have a delivery coming at 3 p.m., you might get ADHD lock where you are unable to really do anything until 3 p.m. when the delivery happens. But on the other end, if you end in a task and zone in the task, it's really hard for you to let it go. I remember like before this whole um, startup and engineering thing, I was doing music and I would end up like waking up in the morning, picking up my guitar and being zoned into playing guitar for 10 hours. And ADHD also is a spectrum, like most things. It's not like binary, either you are or you aren't. It's a spectrum of how intense it can be. And some people have it very, very mild. Some have it somewhat harder. Some people have it really on the other extreme where you might even need medication. For my case, like I built systems for myself. I try to educate myself to understand when I'm in what situation. So I don't end up in anxiety or stress for no reason that will actually kill my productivity and my focus. The idea for me was, okay, for example, using Sigma OS is a big, big proponent to that because anytime I'm doing a specific work where I'm in a specific workspace, which means I have my flow there. Everything I need there is at hand and I don't need to jump big steps to be able to do my work, whether it's I'm doing company hub operations, right? I need my Slack channels, I need my calendar, I need my, you know, um, uh, Calendly and everything like that is in that one place. My Notion docs, everything that I need is there. The second thing, for example, is things like my finances, analytics, separate. And when I go, I'm in that mode and I can say very easily imagine having different desks in your office where you sit at different computers you're like, okay, I'm doing this work for the next hour. And I can really be in that. The second thing is um, making more conscious decision about what you're listening to or what you're doing. For example, I take every 25 minutes, five minutes break and listen to a specific music. If I want to switch my mood to a specific, like, do I want to hide myself? Do I want to mellow myself? Very, very specific music that I want to listen to in that moment that will put me in the right mindset. Interesting enough, I was listening to some uh, interesting EDM music before the podcast because I wanted to, you know, get excited, be excited and be able to, you know, resonate and have a lot of emotions from on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Now, and another interesting thing I do on Sigma OS, I have a morning routine workspace. Everything I need to do within the first hour of the day, I have it there. I go through them like a list. And that basically offloads a lot of planning for the rest of the day for me. If I have an action plan, I know what I do. I don't get distracted and I stick to that for myself. And it will be very hard because I've tricked my brain to be in super focus mode. So at that point, it's harder to get me out of that focus mode. Mm. So when do you know to push? Essentially, when do you know to push through using discipline? versus when do you know it's time to build a system to combat um, ADHD, I suppose? Discipline comes from uh, systems. You can't have discipline if you don't have a system. Like, raw power through it will maybe in a very short amount of time be good, but then you're going to exhaust yourself, make yourself feel shit about yourself, and be like, oh, I'm not doing anything well. Why do I bother? And you will go down a very worse route than anything else. But when you have a system where you're like, another example, throughout the week, these are the days that I take meetings. These are the days that I don't take meetings, right? 
that gives me the headspace of being like, okay, these days I'm going to do this type of work. And it's easier for you to do that. And discipline comes a lot easier to you as well because you have an action plan and you just have to do it. It's the interesting part that um, Michael Phelps had this with his coach of like, for him, the process of, you know, getting to the Olympics and winning those was such a routine. Everything he did every single day was such a routine that discipline was a byproduct. It was like, I don't care what happens at this. As long as I do these five things in this order, I'll be good. And you get into this almost rhythmic thing of like being, I do B, I do, uh, I do A, I do B, I do C, D, E, and done. Okay, next day next day and that's basically comes from a system that builds the discipline do you have days in your week which you save without systems or plans for like free thinking uh yeah friday is usually for me friday or wednesdays are a bit more like i want to have a bit of like thinking to myself usually in the mornings before i get in the office again i give myself that space of like let me go for a walk clear my head, see what comes to my head, and that's it. So again, it goes back to the system of having uh, specific times, modes where you're in and out. Like I'm in my thinking mode. I'm in my uh, work mode. I'm in more like casual where if things fall a little bit through the cracks, it's going to be fine. Also, you, the best thing about ADHD is like um, that you need to do, give yourself room for error. It's fine. It's fine to do mistakes. It's fine to fall short sometimes. Tell me about YC. Everyone okay. who's listening is going to want to know that like, this is the this is the golden goose that lots of people dream of and never make it. Cough, Saba. <laughs> <laughs> I think YC, like every other accelerator and every other uh, VC, it's not going to be the defining factor of your start. Again. Like Veed is such an incredible example of like they thought they weren't good enough or they didn't have the markers they needed. And look at them, how well they're doing now. And but for then on the other. For people who don't know, YC is essentially the best startup accelerator in the world. We met at Veed's office a few months ago. Yeah. And Veed is one of the most, well, it's one of the most successful startups in the UK at the moment. I think they're making loads of money if that's your measure of success. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, but also on the other end of the spectrum, there were things that they thought there were winners, but uh, ended up failing miserably and didn't go that far. Um, and they invested heavily in that and didn't work. It's the same as every, every other. Nobody has a Orbis and says, like, I know what the future is exactly and what startable win or not, right? So whatever you see from any investor, any accelerator, any fund, take it with a pinch of salt. <clears throat> Back to rejection, a lot of those accelerators rejected us, right? Sigma was, uh, one of them was Seedcamp. Seedcamp was like, you guys don't know what you're doing. Clearly, I don't think you're good. And that was when it was just me and uh, I hadn't brought Ali and Sorok. Uh, Antler, decided not to take us to IC because they thought who builds a browser, right? But then YC took us, right? And they have a very strong success rate because once you get in the things that they say make a lot of sense, actually. Uh, what even uh, a company like Veed does is very aligned with uh, YC's ethos of like, make something people want, Iterate over it. Figure out how you're going to basically make the market work. And even when Saba wrote a blog on, you know, how they, they grew uh, their uh, subscribers and their users, Paul Graham, a founder of YC, uh, was mentioned in, you know, those blogs, like the mentality they have, right? So YC is the Olympics of startups, in my opinion. Right. When you go there, it's three months of intensity of like talking to users, trying to build a product they want and growing your product. And then that's it. There is no fat. There is no, let's go 
have drinks with investors or like network events. No, it's just about you and your company and that's it, right? Which so is a you, very high intensity. And you're with other companies, right? Yes, you are with other companies, but even at that moment, you don't really interact as much with the other companies. You do with your batchmates a little bit of life. Um, so you have groups nowadays because the um, amount of companies they let in is a lot higher. So you have groups, you have interactions with those uh, groups, you have uh, YC partners, group meetings, and all that kind of stuff. It's like, funny enough, sometimes those uh, YC group meetings feels a little bit like an AA meeting where you were just <laughs> talking about sitting literally in a circle and trying to talk about like, this is the problem I'm facing. This is the stress that I'm having. How am I solving it? Nobody's trying to impress others there. That's a great thing with YC. Nobody knows um, this better that like you can't impress others just by talking, right? They insist on doing the work. Like the first thing they tell you when you join YC is like, look, you're exceptional. You made it at the top of accelerators, but there's still like more than a 90% chance that you're going to fail. Like, don't think you've made it, you're successful, it's done. That's the reality of YC. Like, um, they are very, very humble when you are within them uh, about there is also a massive luck factor with if you're going to make a sort of work or not. What was the timing? Your thesis match a random occurrence that happened during that time and you got lucky, essentially, and your startup worked. What was the best piece of advice that you received at YC and who was it from? It was, I think the best advice we received was from our group partner, uh, Gustav. So he was the OG, he, he built growth at Airbnb essentially. And before that, he did a startup that uh, basically was before even WhatsApp, uh, was around like mobile based uh, communication, chat apps, right? And they were like taken really, really, really off. And then something happened, WhatsApp and everything and didn't. And then he went to Airbnb and there he built Airbnb's growth. And it was really impressive. And the one thing he told us, which was really interesting, was what is the single use case user will use you for? And that is very important. What is the one thing people come back for? That is the biggest thing that, I made a lot of mistakes on and a lot of startup made mistakes on. It's like you build this cornucopia of like different functionalities about this thesis that you have that serve that thesis. But in reality, it's a lot simpler. You have one feature that that's the thing people keep coming back to. And that's going to be what makes you win against the tech giants. If there's one thing that does it better than anyone else. And if you really think about it and take apart Every startup that made it really big, it's one thing and they do it really, really, really well. And that's it. And everything else they have is in service to that one thing. Again, not the thesis, that one reason people come back. Yeah, and that's the best thing I heard from our partner. I think techie people sometimes struggle to do that because they're so excited about all the features and all the different stuff they've yeah. used. What do you think, what is your one feature then? Workspaces for us, 100%. Workspaces. Any, that's an interesting thing. Like um, for us, it's, we know we've nailed it on the head because when we ask users or people to describe what is Sigma OS, they can really kind of resonate with what we are trying to push forward and they repeat it easily back to us saying it's a workspaces. So if I plan makes it easy for me to be fast, organized, and make me feel like I can be better at what I do, right? Workspaces is the key thing that users are loving and every other functionality that we have is in service to that. Renaming tabs, lazy search, split screen, everything is in service of making every workspace that you have even a better experience. The YC um, ethos is like going you know, into the market, getting feedback, iterating far, and then growing that way. Yeah. The last guest I had on is building 
a new work application tool, which is like Instagram for jobs. So you scroll through applications, people do a, a video intro. Yeah. Um, his, his approach is they're building the tech first. And I asked him about, you know, how do you, how do you know what features to build if you don't know what your customers want? Because they've mostly spent a lot of time building now. And his, his point was that if you asked Henry Ford, I know if Henry Ford said, if you asked people what they wanted, they'd have said a faster horse rather yes. than a car. So you're building something that's very innovative. Do you ever do any blue sky thinking where you're just like, the market is saying they want this, but we're going to make a bet that this is actually a new workflow, which is way better way of doing it. And would you back yourself to do that? Uh, that is a very, very funny and minimizing phrase from Henry Ford. Like there's so much more context to that. And I love when founders that frankly are too lazy to actually do the work of talking to users, use that as an example and as an excuse, because the reality is Henry Ford looked at the market, what the market needed at the end, right? His most important thing that he said was like personalization, right? I give the people option to personalize their car as long as they choose the color black, because there were parts that he realized it didn't matter. But at the same time, the reason the car was made was because of the problem, something like the manure problem in London, right? Because the industrial revolution happened and so many people flooded to big cities and there were so many horses and basically we feared that there's going to be shit stacked up nine feet. So we had to figure out a solution to that problem. So it wasn't about, oh, we have faster horse. It was about the fact that we needed something completely different because people needed more jobs and better transportation because we needed to be on top of this revolution that is happening. So it's one of those things that people say, right? It's the same thing as people that are not sharpest tool in the box say like, oh, humans only use 5% of their brain, not all of it. And if we use all of it, we would be so much smarter. No, you're using 100% of your brain at all points. If not, you would be in a coma. I, I completely get your point. And I think that's, as with all of these sayings, which people just chuck around, there's always yes. like nuance. But that's a, that's a, in that case, it's quite cut and dry. Like, Horse manure is a very obvious problem, and then there's a way to fix it. How about yes. if there's a problem that no one can see, such as shortening attention spans? Is that something where you'd, you'd be like having become like a subject matter expert in browsers and browser technology? Here's a feature we're going to say we think this will roll out. And maybe you might test it with a certain group of users or something. To, and that's the reality. It. Like, as a gut feeling or domain expert or whatever. You can't build hypotheses. You have gut feelings, which you use to build hypotheses. But at the end, data is fact. The reality is he had an assumption, even Henry Ford made a car, but he was iterating with people. It wasn't the fact that let's just put this thing with an engine with four wheels on it and put it out there and eh, it's fine. It was a fact that I thought this was a good bet. We need browsers with Slack-like workspaces. Put it out and people resonated with it. But we also put a lot of different things out that people didn't resonate with and we rolled them out and we had to cancel them because nobody cared for them because we were wrong. And that's the reality of it. The thing is like, yes, you need to take gut feelings and build the thing. But the important part is if you sit there and say, oh, I know for a fact that 100%, I need to build this 100% perfect and then send it out because that is delirious at best. Even like the first car that came out, there was an MB MVP version of it and got iterated over it. So the phrase that your friend or the previous uh, guest used, fair enough, but there's not enough context to it. Yes, the first version, he made it, 
but it was the first version was a success. That's why he kept building it. So don't spend a year, two years. I've seen startups that for two or three years are building this tool and they're thinking that they're going to change it. And they think if I build the best product, everyone will love it. No, it's 50, 50. You build a good product, you have to put it in front of people, get the feedback, build a better product and iterate, have that cycle going on all the time. And every single startup that has ever made it, any successful startup out of the 1200 existing unicorns in the world, all of them followed this process, this one process, talking to users and having the courage almost when they were wrong to scrap and kill their baby, which was their startup and moving on and doing it more and iterating. That's the only way you can. Again, none of us yeah. have the orbos. Yeah, that's it. Well, it sounds like you do. It's, uh, you're sounding like you've got some answers here. <laughs> Tell me, why are so many Iranians so successful? I know like 10 and they're all founders. They're all doing this and that. They all speak four languages. <laughs> this is the thing, like entrepreneurship is a choice, I feel, in the West, in the Middle East or around parts of our world. It's survival of the fittest. So it is a must. You have to be a hustler. You have to figure the things out. And a lot of these Iranians that you talk about, either themselves or their parents were immigrants, right? So they had to move from something. That is the whole mentality of building a startup. Something is bad. I want to go somewhere better. So I built a role to the better. That's basically so that why you... migration. I wanted a lot more in my life and back home was not enough, right? The... I don't, I, I don't like being political. I don't make that much political statements or comments, but like it wasn't what I needed and what I wanted. So I decided to immigrate to UK six, seven years ago on my own, no family, no friends here, just move here and build a life from scratch, from zero, all on my own. I had a backpack and maybe a grand or two grand in my pocket, went to uni here, had to pay for my bills and everything on my own, no government subsidization, nothing, and build everything to this point on my own. And that is why almost every Iranian, every person of color struggles with a lot. And it builds that mentality of like, working hard is more important than being smart. That is insane. So yes. tell me about that first week. Oh, it was terrifying. And a couple of, a couple of K is not a lot of money in London or to be honest, anywhere in the UK. <laughs> it was terrifying because I came into the room I had from my uni and there was no beddings, no nothing. I had no clue. Like I was like, oh, I, I need a pillow and a duvet, fuck. Because I thought at least they would provide that for me. Thank God at least they gave me the mattress and <laughs> I had to go to this thing they call Argus. Didn't know what it was. Had to find it, order it, drag it back. And then literally a few weeks after that, I was like, okay, I need to figure out. Like, I would skip meals. Like, not meals as in like, oh, I'm just going to have one meal per day. Skip days without meals. So I can last the money, stretch the money out. And then teach myself a bunch of like different coatings and stuff like that and try to get a little bit of like part-time work because also from for the nature of my visa i couldn't work full-time during term time so i had to be able to live very lean try to convince the government uh not the government sorry uh the university to give me some sort of scholarship when there wasn't any scholarship for anyone non-european at my university it was like look there are sanctions Everything is expensive. I cannot do anything. I need, I need to help. And literally, basically convinced like the last, I think my last year of uni ended up being free because I literally negotiated for free education. I was like, I cannot pay. I'm not leaping. So let's figure something out. And we're like, fine. That is sick. That's an amazing story. And like, how much is that? 
Did you speak English? Did you learn English in Iran? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, okay. I learned German from uh, TV. I was at a German school back home and oh, then, okay. uh, then learned English again from watching sitcoms and TV shows. And then, yeah. Yep. Pretty much that. That's sick. So you're a tough cookie. Do you ever talk about that when you're raising money? Part of your story? <laughs> Uh, less so, um, they like the idea that essentially all three co-founders, we have similar backstories, by the way, uh, they see us as cockroaches. I remember this story of like, when we told them, because we had a bit of an incident, uh, during our YC time where we had to, I cannot talk very deep about it, like in details, but like we essentially got kicked out of YC and had after two weeks got kicked out because I'm Iranian and we had to figure out something out to be reinstated. So had to hustle our way back into YC after being accepted to YC, being then kicked out of YC, hustle our way back into YC. And that story, when we told the investors, that blew their mind of like, we don't, we don't care what they build. It's just that these people are insane. Like they are hustlers, they, they are problem solvers and whatever, they do, they're going to do it really well. And that's the most important part for like pre-seed, seed round. There is not enough, un unless you build something that overnight has hundreds of thousands of users, investors are investing in you, not in your uh, idea, not in your execution, not in anything else, but like, who is it that is sitting in front of me that I'm going to give X amount of money to? Yeah, that's insane. So how much did you raise? We raised uh, about $4 million uh, at our seat. Ours was a bit odd because we raised like, um, I think 400,000 at the beginning from 7%. Then they suggested, hey, why don't you try to go through YC, uh, stop your fundraising for a seed round, go to YC. And then after YC, you can, you know, try raise more. So we did that and then we got the YC check and at the end of YC, when we were like going through product cons and everything, and it was really going well, we raised the rest of our round, which ended up being about uh, 4 million. Some people who aren't in the startup ecosystem might hear that and be like 4 million. That must have been like a juicy payday. Can you break that down and speak? How, how is that money used? There's not to buy yourself a helicopter. It's no. how do how do startups who uh, raise these big seed rounds how how do they use the money? That is at this point not even a big seed round. Like right now, well, before the whole recession thing happened, uh, seed rounds were getting all the way up to ten million dollars. Like when the whole crypto craze happened, we saw seed rounds happening at like twenty million dollars, even which was insane. But in reality you are taking a bet of like, look, this is going to happen and we're going to make it work, but we need some money to hire, to grow, and uh, to essentially have a bit of, you know, money for all the other stuff that we need. So essentially the money, like $4 million sounds like a lot, but if you put it in the context of like, you need to scale, hire a lot of people, and then uh, flesh out the product and everything. And then also, you know, have money for growth, money for, you know, office space and all the due diligence, which is lawyers, accounting, everything. It ends up being usually that money lasts you about maximum three years, four years, which is our case. Um, so it's not necessarily like, oh, we have four million. We're all good. Like let's let's go buy a yacht or buy a island. So do you think you can make it work in three to four years? How are your numbers at the moment? Oh yeah, hundred percent. No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> uh we've been very fortunate that in the past um this year, since oh uh, well, actually since November, our numbers have been going all the way into the right hand corner. Very good. Top right corner. We love to hear that. And yeah, uh, we've Obviously. been growing consistently every week, uh, more than the standard 7% that you need. And 
we are also a paid tool. So our burn is coming down basically every day. We are seeing every day our burn coming down and down where basically by end of the year, we'll be way past uh, the amount that we need for our next round. We're right now able to say like, we're easily going to run for another two, three years without any problem. Would you ever consider not raising again? Or do you need to raise to get to the next level? Because like obviously Saba and Veed, they, they're bootstrapped. They've now raised money from Sequoia. Yeah. So the thing is, when you're at that stage, um, if you're raising to just keep running, not necessarily is a reasonable thing to do. If you're raising to scale, because you found product market fit, you're hitting it, and you need just some upfront, basically you have ARR and money and you're earning money and you want to just like a upfront payment so you can scale up because you know by end of the year or in two years, you're going to make the money back. That's one reason. And the uh, second one is basically you need some, you figure out the product market fit parts. Your product is working, you know the market, but you need some extra expertise and people who work with exceptional companies like yours at that point and bring them in and help you out to really hit the market and really grow. So that's the other reason to bring fund, which I think is very much like um, Sapo is doing. They raised and a lot of startup that I know that had shit ton of money uh, for the same reason. Like, um, what was the... I can't remember off the top of my head, but there were a few startups like even these days, like strong ARR, they were earning like $12 million and they still raised a series A from like big funds, uh, whether it was Sequoia or H6 and Z because, you know, they see the value of like, okay, now we need to let's scale essentially. What does success look like for you personally? Not for Sigma. Well, I suppose they can be tied, but. Oh, What's your sort of life ambition? For me, life ambition is just being free. Um, freedom is a very important thing. Being able to not worry about a lot of things, whether it's financial, whether it's uh, travel. For example, I am I still have only an Iranian citizenship, and this year I'm getting my British citizenship. Pro uh, hopefully, fingers crossed. Which fingers crossed. We bloody need some people who can actually do something in this country. <laughs> <laughs> so that essentially means a freedom for me, right? I can easily travel and don't have to worry about a lot of things. And financial success also means you don't have to worry about like your bills and everything. And more than that, you can have a comfortable life for yourself, for your partner, your family. And, you know, you can even support your parents easily. So they can have a joyful life because they give so much to, you know, raise me and help me. And so would love to give back a bit. And then obviously bigger than that is being able to make some great change in the world in the, in the sense of like making it easier for a lot of people in my position, in my old position to be enabled to do what they need or want to do. That's a really cool mission statement. Do you have any ideas of like what sort of thing that would look like? Like a world after Sigma or is your attention solely focused in the here and now? I made the issues. So I'm laser focused straight now on the Sigma OS, <laughs> but it would definitely be very much in the field of like, um, being able to help young entrepreneurs or founders to, you know, make the road easier for them and evening out the playing field where you don't have to live in a certain part of the world, know certain people to be able to be successful. What else did you have to sacrifice to get to this stage? I know you don't think you are successful, like you're, you're on the path to where you want to go. Like you didn't eat sometime. Maybe uh... now, now that you've, You've got a bit of a name for yourself. There must you must get invited to parties. I mean, we met at a social event. <laughs> Even now, like so the the weird part is a lot of people think I am very introverted or not social. 
uh, which that's not true. I enjoy yeah, socializing a lot, but yeah, I didn't get that impression at all. Uh, thank you. And I feel like you're a good but, storyteller as well. Thank you. Well, then I'm doing my job right, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's the thing. Like the one thing I still have to sometimes sacrifice is like, um. I cannot go to every party or every social event that I want to do. Sometimes I have to even, it's not that I'm doing work necessarily. It's more like I have to go home and rest. It's like being an athlete that rest is part of your schedule now, right? You have to forgo things to be able to rest so you can run faster the next day. The amount of times I, even when I go to events, I have to leave very quickly. I remember... Uh, one of our investors had this event. I went there literally for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then headed back. It was just more out of like respect and showing face and being like, hey, like I have a few questions for you, but I have to rush back to the office and help the guys because we're doing another product on launch or we're doing this kind of new feature and they need me. And that's the reality of it. Of Even when I was at uni, at some point, I decided I have to put more focus on sharpening my tools and improving my uh, skill set, upskilling myself versus like the enjoyment of socializing. But obviously there's also balance. I, I feel like I might have gone a bit into the extreme where at some point I was working 100 hours a week, which that was definitely not healthy. Um, but now I have a bit of a more balance, I would say. Yeah, I find if I go out, even though it's only for one evening or one social thing, I just get so excited by the whole thing that the next day, then I'm like trying to realign myself with like where I'm trying to go or pull me away from. It. Yeah. Are Very you easily. Religious? No. Not at all. Do you drink? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How I'm often definitely you drink? not a religious person. Um, I only. Funny enough, drink if I'm at a social event, uh, like the party we were at, uh, at Veed's office, but also, by the way, Sava and Veed is getting so much free, uh, promo at this point. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, He's supposed to come on soon. So now I can let's, like, let's, use Yes, it let's, let's, them. let's get the, uh, guest in. So he, he agrees with his half of the deal. Yeah. I was there for that deal, by the way. Um, <laughs> So interesting for like the drinking, I know a lot of people uh, have a lot of thoughts about this kind of stuff, like wearing aura rings and tracking your sleep. And, you know, if you drink, your next day is X or Y. My body type, I haven't gotten a hangover for the past like 10 years, I would say. Not 10 years, well, six years. The last time I was hangover was my first day at Deed, funny enough, uh, because the night before that i drank so 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 much i started to see why you got fired yes uh i was sweating bullets in that <laughs> meeting room uh, bless so, the oh, so what, card for not what killing that? Was me. It, yeah <laughs> it was a boat party the day before that and uh, i was just like drinking so much before that but other than that like i don't get that kind of effect from alcohol um Funny enough, with my friends or fiance, like when we're, whenever we drink a lot, the next day everyone is hangover and I'm fine. And they're like, we hate you. Like I drink like more than them, a lot more than them, and I'm still fine. So that effect is not on me. It's just more like I don't bother or I don't, it doesn't come, drinking doesn't come to my mind as like, oh, I, I really want that like type of drink right now. It will feel good. But like when I'm in a contact, I do enjoy it having different drinks and enjoying myself. Yeah, of course. It's funny. My best mate, Armand, the Iranian one, he also just deals with alcohol very well. It's very annoying. He eats a lot of rice. I think that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, that could what be you, very much it. Yeah. yeah, like Persian food, it's like yeah. sometimes can be very ricey. What do you think of like the London startup scene? Obviously, I'm not going to mention him again, but there's, there's some good companies around. <laughs> Yeah, you have Monzo like... is around. Monzo is really good. Uh, Starling is really good. Um, there is a lot of great startups around um, London. Uh, in Europe, in general, London is the best one, in my opinion. 
and this is just my opinion and a lot of people will get very annoyed depending like people in Paris right now think they're the best people in Munich think they're the best statistically speaking London is the best numbers speak louder than anything and London is not a good track but reality is still the capital of startups startup heaven is still West Coast Bay Area and that's the reality of it um, but I'm quite excited about how even in London, people are becoming a bit more focused on consumer products versus B2B or fintech. Like, like when I just joined, I, when I just came to UK, uh, a lot of people were doing like B2B fintech, uh, uh and B2B SaaS is just, it just sucks the life out of me. I, I do yes. respect it. But like, what happened to the like magic and excitement of like a new product? Because consumer is lives? less, consumer is a lot less protected, right? And a lot harder payout is so much more, so so much more. So that's that's the reality of it. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm excited about like how it's going in. Uh, there's a lot more exciting startups coming around, and there's a lot more even YC companies. Uh, in London, you know, they're going through uh, YC. Like, I remember when I was talking to uh, Tom from Monzo, uh, he mentioned like when he went through uh, YC, they were, I think, the only UK or London based company, the only European or UK based company that went through uh, YC at that time. And now it's just like there is like WhatsApp groups that. Like you go to events almost once every other week that are like 20, 30 different YC companies. That's crazy. I also didn't know that Monzo went through YC. No, no, no. It wasn't Monzo. So Tom did Monzo second. Uh, they did their contingency fund. So Monzo technically got a funding from uh, YC, but uh, their main thing was, I think it was called Go Cardless. Oh, Go Cardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. With Matt Robinson, which both of them very great founders. What, what what startups, maybe ones you've seen from YC, maybe ones in your batch, are there any that you think like that's an amazing product, an amazing team, like look out for? Uh, June 100% is one of them. Uh, Analytic June. Tool. Yeah. They're very yeah. good at their branding. Uh, they're competing with Mixed Panel. Uh, they're very good at what they do. A few of our batchmates already died, so I was quite excited about their product, but didn't go. Example, why they say, even if you go through YC, doesn't mean you're going to be the winner. Yeah, that's so um, sad. It's sad, but that's also the reality. Also Cron life, right? oh, yeah. uh, is a YC company that is quite exciting what they're building. Um, what else? What else? Or some YC companies. I use a bunch of the tools like, um, so Reback was another one. Unfortunately, they pivoted. Their original uh, product was exceptional in my opinion. And I don't think there was anything like it on the market. Every founder would love this. Like all your bank accounts connected in one place where you see all your dollar amount or whatever amounts in one place, categorized expenditure breakdown so you can easily know like okay this is my burn this is where my money is going super easy like right there like takes you 10 seconds and would tell you what your runway is based on your past three six months expenditure so even predicts patterns which was great yeah Loves that's it. cool that's cool but they they pivoted into something else which i'm still sad about and obviously brex amazing company their their founders are exceptionally good at user acquisition so 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 good and then you know we can go to the original ones let's try airbnb yeah yeah coinbase yeah <laughs> have you looked at the other browser companies well obviously you've looked at the other browser companies how do you plan on competing with them and also do you look like do you continually check what they're doing or are you just focused on your mission reality is we are all racing to beat, to kill Chrome. That's the reality. Um, if I outperform any of the 
other companies that are building browsers at the same level as us, I'm wasting our time. Those are not our competitors. Our main competitor is Chrome, Safari. We had two main competitors that were quite exciting. Um, one of them was also YC, Mighty, uh, which stopped and uh, the founder Suhail is now building something super cool in AI and then um, Beam, which was another browser that was quite exciting what they were doing. The rest of them, um, we don't really look at. Uh, I'm sure they have some user base and some fans, but at the end of the day, the winning factor doesn't come the fact that if we win against all the, what we call division three browsers, right? We want to compete and beat the division two and division one uh, browsers, which are like Brave, Firefox, Edge, Opera, Chrome, Safari, be one of the top threes. Not just like, okay, we, we beat, you know, Stack or Sidekick or Mighty or Beam. Do you have a moment in your head where you're like, when the days are really hard or when you're doing something really boring, like how do you, how do you stay on your mission? Or are you just like, I'm on my mission? And I thought. I remember also the good times, the exciting times when uh, a few months ago, everything was breaking because we were getting so many signups in a row. We, we were at like a couple users per minute and we were all our whole like user signup flows were on Airtable and we we're maxing out the roles that we had on Airtable. So we were freaking out and every day we had to delete a few thousand like uh, rows. So we have enough people for the next day and basically try to migrate and move like people around and moments like that are quite exciting. Super stressful, super, super stressful. Couldn't sleep, but also super exciting. Or our first product or second or third product on launch where basically uh, out of the blue product on mentions us as the next new browser. Or, you know, when we see, oh, we hit part of the day, part of the month, or when we won, uh, we became one of the best design tools of 2022. Those were moments that are like so memorable that makes the hard days, which there are a lot of it, predominant days are hard days, a lot more enjoyable. Do you think there's a thing like before you have one of those first big milestones, then that's like pure, just self-driven. But once you get one, then you can use that to jump to your next one. Yeah. The so thing the is... people who are just starting out, you'd say like, just stick. Well, yeah, just stick with it until you just believe in yourself, bet on yourself. And bet you on yourself. That thing. Bet don't, don't necessarily put heavy emphasis on the startup that you're doing. Bet on yourself that you can make a market work, make a product work, make a startup work, right? You might have to pivot and that's absolutely okay. That's not a bad thing. And if you fail, that's also a good thing because now you know one more way not to try something. That's it. Move on to the next thing. But bet on yourself no matter what, you're going to be the person that going to make it. That, that's the reality of it. That's how I, how even to these days, like including those good moments, I have this rage for success. I don't have an urge or ambition or drive for success. I have a rage for success. I believe in myself that no matter what, I'm going to make it. Whether it's this or that. And right now it's Sigma OS. But I'm going to make it. That's sick. That's sick. <laughs> yeah, where does that come from? Is it from your journey from Iran and all of that background? Watching a lot of Dragon Ball, I think, when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is generally the mentality um, of just believing in yourself when others sometimes might not, might um, tell you you're being insane or stupid that you think you can go to YC. You think you, you're a person that will have a seed round of X million dollars or whatever. Just believe in yourself. What it, it doesn't come necessarily from, from anywhere, just from myself of like, what's the worst thing? That could happen. Like, I believe in myself. I was wrong. Fine. Try again. You've got such a good mindset on all of these things. <laughs> Is there any other like mindset or thought process you have, which is like, um, 
against popular belief, contrary, that has served you well? Another thing is like there is a difference, and this is something a lot of people don't realize. Being honest and um, you know very transparent is very different to being cruel and being rude. A lot of people mistake that. They think, I'm just being honest. No, you're being an ass. That's very different. Um, but also, you don't have to care about people's opinion. These are two things where if I'm trying to be honest with you, I try to still be respectful. And actually, what I'm saying is, it's not just cruel and making you feel shit about yourself. I'm actually trying to add value to you. And if what I'm saying to you, in honesty, doesn't add actual value to you, there is no point of me saying it to you, right? The second thing is, I, I am one of the people that is maybe a bit to the extreme, um, really don't care about people's opinion on me. And some people, a lot of people think I'm arrogant about that, but people that actually know me know actually I'm not arrogant, funny enough. Um, I just don't think um, like it matters what people say about you if you really have good intentions and try to do the best thing because you never know who is being honest with you about certain things or tries to bring you down or trying to give you actual value. So whatever you hear, take it with a pinch of salt, process it for yourself and decide for yourself instead of taking anything everyone says as, you know, word of God or as a divine thing that's like, oh, it's the fact or truth. Just yeah. take it with a pinch yeah. of salt. Except like facts from scientists. Facts from scientists, take them as facts. They're not opinion. <laughs> They're facts, people. <laughs> Except that. <laughs> I like the saying, um, which is like, you never, you never see a hater doing better than you. Yeah. Because people who are like throwing rocks at you, they're unlikely. People ahead of you don't throw rocks at you. That would be ridiculous and a waste of time. So yes. I, yeah, it's an important thing to remember. So what would success look like coming to the, towards the end of this conversation? Where do you think Sigma OS will be in five years when we do another podcast? Well, we'll do more, but. Uh, success for Sigma OS looks like a, we built a browser that is generation defining, you know, there are technologies that we have these days that have changed how we live, how we work forever. Uber, iPhone, Airbnb, Dropbox, Notion, all these things, ChatGPT, change how we use or live our lives forever. They were generation-defining tools. And what we want to be is a generation-defining browser where it changes how people look, think about the way they live, work, and spend their time on their internet. And by doing that, essentially change the internet. Our goal is to change the internet forever. And that might be coming a lot sooner than five years. I can't wait to watch. I'm going to be a power user of Sigma. <laughs> and hopefully... Awesome. My my wish for your success with Sigma is one day you don't have to be the one who's um, fielding my uh, issues and when I can't work something out, you're replying to my text. <laughs> I'm more than happy, even <laughs> if it's a billion or a $10 billion company, feel free to ping me directly, be like, I cannot figure this out and I'm more than happy to jump on a call. <laughs> okay, we have video evidence now. So yes. I'll, be, I'll be sharing that with you in 10 years. All right, Thank well, you. thanks, bro. Thank you for taking the time. It's a Friday of evening course. and I really do appreciate it. There's some absolute gems of information in there for people. Thank um, you for your time. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And thank you for your audience for listening. <laughs>